we haven't had an update on what's going on. And I know there was a mass day of action earlier this month and that the movement is only growing stronger, that this repression is not silencing people. It is um, awakening them. It is galvanizing them. The lengths to which the police and the city of Atlanta will go to um, override the will of the people on this uh, building, this complex. But we're, can you just give us an update? Yeah, well, what is the state of everything and uh, right now? Sure. Well, you, you know, just to go back a little bit post Tortuguita's assassination, as you said, um, since that time, the 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 week before, the month before that time, the uh, police, along with the police, the Atlanta police, the DeKalb County police, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, some reports indicate the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Homeland Security began to conduct raids in the forest. And in that first forest raid, uh, they arrested approximately 12 to 13 people. And then it was the second raid in which Tortuguita was killed, to which others were arrested. And since that time, we now have a total of 60, over 60 people who've been charged with domestic terrorism. And then quite recently, uh, approximately now three weeks ago, uh, we had folks who, well, probably a couple of months ago, but three weeks ago for the arraignment, we had all the folks who were previously arrested tied together in RICO charges, to racketeering charges. Um, and so folks are also dealing with that. And obviously, since the assassination of Tortuguita, we have demonstrations, rallies, town halls. We mentioned um, the Block Cop City action, which took place uh, approximately two weeks ago which was a mass configuration of people from outside of Atlanta and some in Atlanta who came together to encircle or to uh, stop work at the site. And on the march, uh, which was uh, on the street, they were met by a line of police who began throwing tear gas and sound blasters or, 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 or sound grenades. Uh, I was amongst the folks who were was in uh, the march itself. Um, and so this type of repression and, and the ways in which we saw the repressiveness, have repressive tactics of the police, again, was further indication for all of us of the militarization of police. Again, the, the training of police, not here in Atlanta, but across the country that would take place with a cop city facility that was that would be built. And the further training, internationally speaking, of soldiers with the IDF, uh, police agencies within Israel, which have already done work with Atlanta in terms of continual militarization of police. I will mention this one particular fact when it comes to the Israeli police and the connection with Atlanta. The Atlanta police give credit to the Israeli surveillance system as the ways in which they set up their own surveillance system here in Atlanta. So in other words, a police captain went to Israel, spoke about the surveillance system that he was shown and 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 he was quite enthusiastic about duplicating in Jerusalem, brought that mm -hmm. system back to Atlanta. Atlanta is now the most surveilled city in the world outside of five cities in China. Wow. Um, that's so that's what it's believable. Birthright for cops uh, uh, is truly an incredible program. I, I do want to ask you because I yeah, the, what has happened is this RICO case, right? Which which happened simultaneously with the, you know, the Trump RICO case in Georgia, which was so searing and ironic, and I think almost like Palestinian liberation and this whole question of this this you know being honest about what's going on there, um, in Gaza, is this interesting divide between like what is safe for liberal media and libs? Hey, we all hate Trump. And then at the same time, how RICO is being used against nonviolent protesters in Atlanta. And it's like, we're just, you know, okay, we're just not going to talk about that. But that is massive to have, um, you know, the, the state judicial system weaponized against you like this. Can you talk more about, like, yeah, what's the state of that RICO case? I mean, it, it's so absurd. We looked at, I, I think I've in other programs looked at some of like the details it's like putting up a poster that maybe had the circle a on it if even that i think when you look back at the starting off with this if you look back at the history of of let's say surveillance in the 60s and 70s we reached a point in this country where the watergate surveillance right where basically one party surveilled another and then got busted um, the media was all over that once that story broke, right? That was a huge story. So power fighting against other power, 
was huge as in terms of a football game view of it of one team against another. At the same time, the surveillance was going on and going on under going on under Democratic as well as Republican regimes. COINTELPRO was still happening, the counterintelligence program of the 60s and 70s, which basically mass surveilled uh, the civil rights movement, including Dr. King, the Black Power movement, uh, white radicals, the anti-war movement. That was barely covered in the media, even when documents leaked. So mm -hmm. you have when organizers or activists um, are attacked by the state, uh, the state itself uh, is allowed to do that or given given credence to do that by media by claiming that they're doing something around the issue of criminality. Um, right. And the media either doesn't cover it or it covers it in a certain way to lead the general public to believe that uh, the, the state is actively going after some sort of criminal element. And as you stated, these RICO indictments are on their face as a former practicing attorney talking to other attorneys who've looked at the actual indictment, it, it reads as, as, as humor, as, as, as something right. which people can't believe that a lawyer filed this, and this is considered a real indictment. This indictment traces the, uh, uh, the so-called criminal conspiracy by the 61 people who've been teamed together, who a lot of which of course have never met, some of which came one day to a music festival were cordoned off by the police. Their IDs were checked. Uh, if they had in-state IDs, they were let go, in-state Georgia IDs. If they had out-of-state IDs outside mm -hmm. of Georgia, they were arrested and charged with domestic terrorism and later charged with the RICO charges. So not people who have been involved in Cop City organizing or actions, but people who just happened to come to a music festival are now facing domestic terrorism charges and RICO charges. And so when the state does this, it does this to scare organizers and activists and to label those folks as criminals um, and to try to make it so that they can't uh, and or won't participate in further actions because they're scared off. So what, what was the strategy with arresting out-of-state people? Was it like, uh, oh, these out-of-state, you know, hooligans are the ones coming in, like stirring up stuff? Or what, well, yeah, what was the narrative there? The narrative, which they, the state has been pushing since the very beginning of this, is that this is not sort of an indigenous or local movement to stop Cop City, but this is outside agitators. This is their language specifically. The city, the city, the, the mayor, the governor, the, again, the right wing white Republican governor and the so-called liberal uh, Democratic black mayor have teamed up together to use the same language of Southern segregationists to call people who are protesting outside agitators. And so their basic premise, and this is also part of the indictment, where they go through a history of what they say anarchism is, describing mm -hmm. anarchism, giving us uh, 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 different definitions of it, and saying that this is the leading cause and reason for uh, the Stop Cop City movement, basically, again, painting it as an anarchist movement, as opposed to the locally led movement of a diverse group of people from civil rights activists to community organizers, activists to, to, to environmentalists who are organizing against Cop City. That's ironic because like anarchists don't really believe in borders, you know, and state borders also. So it's kind of like, you know, we're all from the same place. <laughs> they just but... keep using the exact same playbook. It, it, I mean, there's like, there's like 10 different ways they can frame this so that it always makes people feel like it's authoritarianism working on their behalf. And the, the ultimate irony in this one, which you kind of alluded to, is that this is, th what is being protested, aside from where it is being built, is this sort of training is what is being utilized against this movement. There's kind of this like toppling within itself it's so mad irony. <laughs> yes, yes. That is like you're trying to stop the police from getting further out of control, and the police are using their out of control military ways to try to silence it. And I'm sure and, Biden will say, "Well, that's why we need to build it." You and know, give more cops. Yeah. The solution to everything is always more cops. I mean, uh, remember at the training, yeah. training. Yes. Well, remember at the uh, State of the Union address, maybe two years ago, when Biden stood up and said, "Don't defund the police, yeah. but fund the police," and he got yes. a standing ovation 
from both sides of the both sides of the aisle, from the as Republicans well as I would and say the Democrats. A lot, a lot of the liberals who had changed their profile picture during the BLM movement, mm -hmm. who then sort of lost the thread of that argument and fell right into that camp yeah. as well. And then you well, also had a the petition recently, right? They have just stalled your petition. Yeah. Can and, you talk yeah. a little bit about, you know, the, the actual vote, like actually putting it to the people yeah. of Atlanta? So what happened, so basically the organizers went on the offensive and called for a, a basically a petition drive to have on the ballot, a ballot initiative uh, to let the people themselves decide and vote on whether or not cop city should exist. Uh, organizers went out and collected over 116,000 uh, ballot ballot signatures, uh, most of which in which we verify that we met the standard procedure for to have this on uh, as uh, put on as a ballot initiative. The city of Atlanta decided to not count or not verify those uh, those signatures. And so they are sitting in limbo. Uh, there's various court cases working through the courts right now. But basically, they made it so that we missed the November deadline for having this petition on. And the earliest we could possibly have it on would now be in March of next year. At the same time, they're continuing to build out Cop City as we speak because they've cordoned off the area uh, and they've made sure that the developers um, and the corporations that have put money into this are going to get what they want, which is a militarized police training center, which is going to be continually opposed to organizers, activists, and like you said at the beginning, continue to over-police black and brown and poor communities. Mm -hmm. But it'll have a Chick-fil-A, so, or whatever the hell is going to be there. Yeah, can you talk about, because like in the Wilani Forest, like we're talking about just cutting it down or large portions of it. So maybe like physically how it's going to look or what their plans are, but then also was weren't there plans to not to do that and have it be a green space for the people of Atlanta? And how did that take such a, a massive U-turn other than I am assuming corporate cash and donations? Well, like you said, it took a massive U-turn, particularly after the uprisings of 2020, after Breonna Taylor was killed, George Floyd was killed here in Atlanta, Rashad Brooks was killed. Basically, the Atlanta Police Foundation, in, 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 in contingent with the city of Atlanta and the Atlanta Police Foundation and Atlanta Police themselves, decided to dust off old plans of building out this cop city idea. So this was an idea that they had plans for uh, that they did never moved on. But mm -hmm. they decided after the uprisings of 2020 against police violence, when people were calling for defunding the police, when people were calling for the abolition of police, when people were calling for finding alternatives for public safety, Atlanta ignored all of that and decided to push this idea of building this massive militarized police training center. One quick note that I wanted to get out earlier was that the the, the indictment against the those charged with RICO mm -hmm. traces the beginning of the so-called conspiracy, this criminal conspiracy, not to when we started organizing against Cop City, but mm. they trace it to the day that George Floyd was assassinated by the, the cop. Oh that for them my God. in their own document is the beginning date for the conspiracy in which people are being charged for, the beginning of the criminal enterprise. Um, so I wanted to make sure that was known. The, how, how are they like honestly getting away with that? It's that it's so racist and messed up. It's just um yeah. they got uppity. They yeah. got uppity with the amount of black people that were being assassinated by cops. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that people had the nerve to protest against police violence. How dare you? That in well, itself is a threat, right? You you honestly, it's it's so fucked up to look back and be like, it might have been better to not have had this moment that felt like this actual swing moment. In retrospect, it just kind of made the establishment really strengthen the grip around all of that dig in their heels i mean occupy arguably did the same thing although yeah. then it gave us it, once they once they get scared once they see that there is actual uh, that something is coming for them then they react in this more yeah i mean it's it's the state of any rep repressive fascist like state right yeah yeah as soon as there's any pressure put on it to do anything democratic or not to do something to take away more rights it continues to to use whatever power it has Everything. to protect itself and so that's what's happening. So really quickly about the green space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, well, the Walani Forest is adjacent to a working class black community. 
uh, and that black community was promised, and, and the entire community was in promise that that space, uh, the Walani Forest, would be used for camping trails, parks, playgrounds. In other words, there were documented uh, um, plans which were already on the table for how that area would be used. Again, as soon as the uprisings happened and they cleared the deck, all those plans were pushed to the side and they ushered back out these plans that they had to build this militarized police training center. It's just so fucked. Yeah, it, it, it's so I mean, it also feels like. I mean, look, Standing Rock. won ostensibly, right, like, you know, um, and. Yes, there was the, you know, the Mount Valley, what is it? Mountain Valley pipeline that Mansion got past. But, you know, Standing Rock was that watershed moment. Um, it feels like when it comes to indigenous rights and it comes to like protecting water and whatnot. And I do feel like Cop City, I mean, it does feel like a lot of the energy from 2020 is funneling. If they, if they call, if they say that it's the beginning of the, you know, George Floyd moment, okay, sure, let's give it to them. You know what I mean? Because it's like, a lot of the efforts that came out of 2020, I mean, legislatively completely died completely. Nobody, as Gareth said, had, you know, the balls to basically stand by it. Um, and in on local on the local level, any like efforts to move money and there have been some efforts to move money out of, you know, these massive police budgets. Um they've also tried to find weasel. I mean, no, here in LA, like finding ways to weasel out of, you know, actually having to give 10% up of, you know, the LAPD's budget um, or getting the money from somewhere else or, you know, in massive media campaigns to basically naysay some of the efforts to, you know, move money out of the police force. All this didn't work. They defunded it. You know, the right is saying we already defunded the police somehow that it was defunded when, you know, we marched. If only that's how e yeah. how easy uh, social change happened. So it's almost like this feels like it does. And I'm sure, let me, tell me about the organizers and the folks. Does this feel like a continuation of some of that, that you know, BLM energy? No, I mean, I think this is, we're definitely in a period of, of what I would call heightened consciousness and heightened mo mobilization. Obviously not just on police murders, cop city, uh, going all the way back to Occupy uh, Occupy Wall Street. Now here in terms of the issue of Palestine, in my lifetime of being uh, an ally of the Palestinian movement and liberation cause, I've never seen this type of reaction. So there's obviously a moment where people are reckoning with capitalism, with authoritarianism, with the U.S. hegemony. And I think that's it. We're in a period where that is ongoing. And mm -hmm. I think the state has reacted in certain ways. I mean, I don't think anybody really thought the state was going to defund its police, right? The the use of the police forces uh, in, in, in a domestic level is what keeps the powers that be in charge and in place, in place uh, with the powers to arrest, murder, um, uh, 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 bring people to court, uh, lock people up for extended periods of time. They're not giving up that power. And right. I would also say that, you know, during the movement, um, what we had is when the movement was dying down a little bit in 2020, 2021, is a, is a new narrative of high crime, right? The yes. media, the powers that be, the politicians seized on a post-COVID so-called uptick in crime to suggest that we needed more police. And that was the theme mm -hmm. that they were running on. Um, and so our understanding of this is that we never necessarily expected them to do anything in our favor without continually putting pressure, organizing, um, movement building and so forth. And so we will have to continue to do that. There's no, uh, you know, there's no like uh, giving up of resistance uh, and it, under any expectation that the policing agencies which oppress us are somehow, uh, and the people who lead them, they're somehow going to see the light. Like this takes, this is going to take a lot more organizing action and struggle before we see the type of changes that we really want to see uh, because the state with their, the capitalist allies or the capitalist allies, the capitalists with their state allies, I should say, um, are not giving up their power, their resources without a fight. I had a last question around, you know, Georgia as this, you know, as this force on the national scale, you know, in terms of like, you know, turning Atlanta, Georgia turning blue in the last election. And it is so, I guess my, it's just a commentary, but again, 
Biden, who says we need to fund the police and yet ostensibly was put into power thanks to the movement around BLM that wasn't a pro-Biden movement, but sure as shit was like the repression under Trump, the again, extrajudicial killings under Trump, like we don't want that. And we and yes, we will throw in our lot here with Biden. Obviously, you've got, you know, Georgia and the flipping of the Senate was huge. Um Stacey Abrams not being um, governor, but with a massive movement behind her, like it, it feels almost cruel, like scripted cruelty to have Cop City be built in Atlanta, in this state that, again, flipped blue for Biden and a Democratic Party that's f done fucking nothing around, uh, you know, prison reform or cop reform or anything like that, but maybe just your thoughts on like what, how this bodes sort of nationally and, and where yeah, I mean, I would, that. yeah. I mean, I would argue that it wouldn't be a surprise that this would happen under democratic regimes or democratic leadership, whether locally or nationally. Most of the cop killings that have happened um, in cities have happened under democratic regimes uh, who've been the leadership of those police agencies who's the, who've done nothing to curtail their over-policing and use of violence because they are, uh, in a lot of ways, they want that over-policing and use of violence. So the one, right. the things that we can agree upon with, uh, that the Republicans and Democrats are always going to be on the same page on are cops and capitalism. Right. Uh, and so there's no light really there when we have those things. So we're not surprised by that, even under the, the so-called new uh, progressive senators, none of them have come out against Cop City. None of them took a stance against Cop City. Stacey Abrams didn't take a stance against Cop City. The mayor of Atlanta pushed Cop City and again, worked with a white right-wing Republican governor who is overtly a white supremacist in a lot of ways. Uh, they found walking hand in hand, using the language of Southern segregationists to put down a movement to stop police violence. These folks, whether Republicans or Democrats, as Malcolm X used to say, whether wolves or foxes, mean no good for the black community. They mean no good for working class communities. They are there to protect capitalism and they protect capitalism through their cops. Do you feel like that's turning maybe the electorate? Like, I mean, <laughs> do you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, just yeah. just like souring them on the, you know. I think Biden has a lot of problems. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I think Biden yeah. has a lot of upcoming issues in respect to telling people like us or people who are liberal to progressive, um, I'm more of a radical, but liberal to progressive folks that um, stay with me because I can provide all these good things for you. When we see on issues of policing right. and even more importantly at this particular moment, someone who's actively funding a genocide, who's actually providing cover for a genocide, to think that we can put all of that to the, to the side because there is another evil character who the claim is that they're going to do worse. They're going to do worse than, than what Biden is doing in Palestine. It's like, oh, really? So instead of 16, 17,000, what, we're going to get the numbers up more? So okay. it's, not a, it's not a winning argument for me. Um, and I would think for a lot of people who are having a second and third thoughts that the lesser of two evil thing is something that's going to work to bring people out in large support. It may not bring people, as I think some of the polls are suggesting, to go out and vote for Trump. But it will make people stay home and say, who cares? Um, right. Who gets in? Because my struggle is in the street. My struggle is against both parties and against this entire system. And that's what I'm hoping that people get out of this continually, as opposed to thinking that one party or another is going to save us. Calling yourself a radical, because progressive, the term for a while was like, all right, I can identify with that until it actually, like every other movement, movement got co-opted by capitalism and sort of usurped and sucked into that. And I think- I, I think it's when Elizabeth Warren had a giant um, Bailey, uh, inflated Bailey dog. That's when I stopped being a progressive. <laughs> my, my, I think around the time where uh, AOC wore the dress to the Met Gala, where I was like, this is a 9-11 dress for me. Uh, I'll never forget. But I also, forgive. I'm a stan. I'm I'm a stu. I'm a I'm a I'm I a Swifty for AOC. Keep going. Oh no. I uh, I also think that um, Brian Kemp got softened when he sort of became to the liberals became a bit of um an uh, a a resistance to Trump. Oh yes. I, I think that sort of softened him for people, and he, like you said, is is so dangerous. What um what 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 helps support you guys that people who aren't 
in Georgia or Atlanta, what is the best way to to support, to give credence mm -hmm. to the movement? Well, if you go to our website, communitymovementbuilders.org, what we have there is a Stop Cop City page. Um, and there's a list of things that we ask people to do who are not in Atlanta, not in Georgia, in terms of helping to support the movement. And that is everything from doing uh, the easy stuff of calling, emailing elected officials to uh, a list of developers who are involved in Cop City and people yes. doing direct action, people organizing protests, people going to uh, uh, their places of business, their storefronts or whatever, and protesting in front of them. Uh, the corporations, uh, so asking folks to boycott and to call out the corporations who have given upwards of 40 to $50 million into Cop City. Um, so we ask people to do those actions continually, whether it's social media, live actions, call in actions. Uh, those are the ways that folks can help. And when we call for weeks of actions, and there will be more of them, we do ask people to come to town. We do want the outside agitators coming to town and agitating with us um because we want folks don't bring your ID. to know bring it yeah don't bring your id yeah, yeah. that's don't even bring your cell phone one. honestly because yeah. some of the surveillance tactics you're talking about are so sophisticated and insane um oh yeah definitely well there i mean the tracking of people through obviously cell phones these the hooking up of the the when i talked about atlanta being the most surveilled city the hooking up of surveillance between cameras that can oh, yeah. basically follow you everywhere. Uh, so they have an amazing system of surveillance and what I would call criminality at work. Yeah. And I think we need a people's movement to stop them. Yeah, These universities are invested. I'm here at the page. That's wild. It's crazy. I, and that's so disgusting. It, it really is such a, it, it is so, I mean, again, it's like, I think you always feel like you're kind of at these hinge moments but this is such a hinge moment um, for a great, there's like a nice convergence of taking away land and what you're building on it. And it is as egregious as it gets. I mean, lastly, like what about media coverage? And then like, I know maybe Asaf and Warnock are like, they're not showing up, but are you guys making sure they know that they're, that oh, they're on the wrong they side of this? Oh, they know. Yeah. And yes. Well, we can call been, them. Like that's, a, that's an easy phone call. Definitely <laughs> call. Yeah. No, that's part. We want calls and so forth. But we've had protests at, at various events that they've speak that they've spoken out. Speakers have challenged them at events in terms of talking about Cop City. And they've given wishy-washy answers, right? Uh, and the only times they've made any statements have been on the RICO charges and they gave some bland statements. Um, and at the time of the arrests of the people who ran the bail fund, um, with false and fake charges of white crime or white collar criminality, uh, they also made a statement. So let's be clear, uh, the bail fund, the infrastructure movement is being attacked. Bail funds have been around for over 100 years. The county and the state of Georgia is going after the Atlanta bail fund, which has been around way before even the Cop City incident. And I want to end with this. So, you know, there's a confer convergence here happening on both sides of the aisle. So what we see against uh, for those who are the uh, uh, the establishment has converged. And so, again, whether or not that's corporations, Republicans, Democrats, capitalists, developers, they have converged around the idea of wanting Cop City built. But on the flip side of that, we've had a vast array of movement organizers and activists, everything from environmentalists to grassroots organizers to anarchists, anarchists. Uh, to civil rights workers, to voter rights workers, who've all come out and said that they were opposed to Cop City and who have all continued to use their leverage. So we are building a movement in Atlanta, which is going to go further than whatever happens with Cop City, yeah. which will right. challenge elected officials and do grassroots organizing on the ground for years to come. And that's really what we're building in Atlanta. And that's really going to be the outcome of this struggle against Cop City. Absolutely. I think that's excellent. And it need there needs to be left pressure in that state, you know, and like you're saying, it can't just be the, you know, Stacey Abrams and Ossoff and Warnock sort of taking all the air out of the the room when it comes to progressives. We're radicals, damn it. Um, come out, Franklin. Thank you so much for taking time. Um, everybody, communitymovementbuilders.org. Check it out. Sign the petitions. Make those calls. And um, yeah, it's Giving Tuesday. So kick some funds if you can as well. 
What's going on, Frantifa? If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel right now. Hit that button. And also, you can become a patron and support the show every single week. Get access to bonus episodes and exclusive merchandise. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room. Do it.